I don't know how many of you like Christmas movies. Um, I'm not going to get into a heated battle with any of you afterwards about which Christmas movies are not even Christmas movies or they're Christmas movies because they have a scene that's about Christmas or, or all those things. But some of you in this room, now I'm, I'm trying not to offend you too much this morning, just a little. Some of you since Thanksgiving have been binge watching the Hallmark Channel. All right? Uh, you, you, you love your Christmas movies. Um, some of you, now you, you again, you, some of you just checked out because you know I'm about to pick on them, all right, for just a moment. But I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it's the same. It, the same actresses, too. Like, it's amazing. Like, and, and here's how it goes. It's just repackaged, uh, usually the same cast. Um, here, here's the setting. Um, I, I reached out to a couple guys here, and, and they, they, they wrote us a plot for our, our Hallmark movie. I just want you to hear it. Here it goes. A city girl who's the CEO of a reef company. <laughs> she returns home to her small, quaint town for Christmas. Mm, right? Woo. She meets a guy who is selling vegan wreaths. We don't even know what those are, but we just made them up, all right? <laughs> 2023, right? I mean, and, and, and she, the reason they meet is because she backs up and knocks down his booth at the trade show selling Christmas goodies, right? They exchange glances. They fall in love. Then one fateful night, he discovers that this lady has been keeping a secret. She is the CEO of the company that's trying to buy him out. Over. <laughs> Until the townsfolk, right? They all come together and they start working their magic and they, they bring them back together. They have a change of heart. They fall back in love. She moves to the small town and she opens a bigger vegan wraith division. They live happily ever after. And as they kiss in the final scene, what happens? It, it snows. And we have titled this an unbereathable Christmas. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's how it works. If I see this on Hallmark, I know one of you went home and wrote it and submitted it, all right? It's okay. But most Christmases, the moment movies, the moment they start, you figured it out. What's ironic about that is there's nothing expected to humankind about the arrival of Jesus. Now, it was expected in some ways that we're going to back up and see for just a moment because of prophecies that had been told. But if you're there 2,000 years ago and these circumstances unfold, you're going to go, I didn't expect that. Even the characters in the story leading up to the birth of Jesus are unexpected. Two weeks ago, we saw a prophet Isaiah. He talked about that Jesus would come and for unto us, a, a child will be born, a Messiah, a king, a prince of peace would come. They prophesied where he would come. They prophesied what time he would come in history. They talked about that it would come through a virgin birth in the region of Nazareth, which was a side street, a small town of no value to culture. So in that sense, though, because of the prophecies, the arrival of Jesus was expected. Yet, if you existed then, you would go, this is not quite how we imagined this would have happened. The people then would not have imagined this would be a way. They were waiting for the expected. They wanted a king to be worshipped, a king to be served, not a servant. Out in Malachi says this, at the close of the Old Testament, not the last verses of the Old Testament, but, but growing towards the end of it, there's prophecies still being made about what will happen in this unexpected arrival of four unto us. Behold, I send a messenger, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So there's, there's going to be one that's going to come before Jesus that we're going to learn about today, but there's a prophecy even about that detail. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Then something happens. 
Malachi is the last prophet that we have recorded in the Old Testament. Multiple prophecies are made. And then, for 400 years, there is no angels coming to speak to people. There are no prophets of Israel that are named to speak more about the coming Messiah. It grows silent for 400 years. Now, 400 years is a long time. 400 years is about eight or nine of our generation's minimum. 400 years, people have been waiting. This coming Messiah, this expected king is coming. And now you have this remnant of people they're expecting. But, but will they get what they think they want? Imagine you've been waiting for a word from God as a group of people and you've been practicing the law. You've been practicing going to the temple, making your sacrifices, doing all the things that you are called to do. And then... In Luke chapter 1, chapter 1, not chapter 2, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, we hear of how the silence was broken. Here's how the silence is broken. In the days of Herod, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Right here is unexpected character. Let me me point out a couple to you. Uh, The first one is in the very first sentence there, the very first phrase, In the days of Herod. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time giving Herod too much credit and talk time, right? Because Herod was an evil tyrant king. He had been placed over this region by Rome to lead this region for the Romans to collect their taxes, to keep it under rule, and to send their money back. And so Herod, one historian says this about Herod. It would have been better to be his pig or pet than his wife or son. You get the glimpse? <laughs> you, you get the understanding because those, some of those have been put to death. But, but if, maybe if you were a pet, maybe that wouldn't happen to you. That's the guy that's mentioned here. And here's why I put this in here. Here's why we need to study Scripture and dig in. Herod is not just a name drop for Scripture. Herod is putting the story of Jesus on the historical map. It's putting us in a timeline of when this took place. It verifies not only the spirit and the spoken word of God, but it verifies it to those historically by saying, well, this fits in this time period. There there was a king. His name was Herod. You can research him. Herod, king of Judea. And then our next two unexpected folks that maybe you've never discussed at Christmas. There was a priest named Zechariah. Of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. It goes on to say that they were righteous before God. They walked blamelessly in the command and the statutes of God. Now, it does not mean that everything went smooth for them in life. In fact, what's amazing about the two of these people is they had walked Scripture says, follow the statutes and the commandments of God. Blamelessly, they were righteous. They were upstanding. They continued their responsibilities of worship and their opportunities of prayer, their responsibilities of going to the temple. All the while, one of a wife and a mother, future mother's greatest prayers had yet to be answered. She was barren. And I love that it doesn't tell us that first. I love that it tells us that their character was blameless and righteous. Then it tells us in verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Yet, they were blameless and righteous. Some of you can identify Maybe with their situation, maybe with another situation that you may have walked through for years and years and years in your personal life. What a testimony, though, here to start. Just an unexpected testimony right here in these verses. They were faithful to worship, to continue to pray, even when their prayer had not been answered yet. They didn't stop. 
They didn't put a pause on it and go, well, I, I'm upset at or I'm mad at or I'm distancing myself. No, they, what a tremendous example from these two characters. Then verse 8 begins to dive into the story that we're going to stick in today. Verse 8 says, now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, there is so much here. There are so many unexpected moments in this part of the story. So we've got to understand their story. Zechariah is a priest um, from this certain line, this certain division, and that means a lot, or maybe actually it doesn't mean a lot to us at all in 2023. I've said over and over and over, I'm glad I'm a pastor in 2023, not a priest um, in 5 um, BC, 5 AD, in that, in that region, because of all the responsibilities. So priests, they were divided up into groups of people and divisions, and even inside of those divisions were further divisions. And those divisions would be assigned their time of the year to go and serve in the temple. Now, they would live in a, a commune, in a group of people, these priests would. This was their entire life. So it tells us that Zechariah, it was his division's turn. They were on duty at the temple. Now, what does that mean? They're on duty at the temple, meaning they would come. People would bring sacrifices. They would make sacrifices for the people on behalf of the people. They would go in. They would pray for and lift up prayers for the people. But there was one specific task that if you were fortunate enough, literally, if you got chosen by lot, meaning they rolled the dice, all right? They rolled the dice. Oh, Zechariah, it's your turn. Today is your day. You might never have this opportunity again, Zechariah, because our division of the division has been chosen. We're going to the temple. It's our season to be there. You get to go into a holy place, and you get to burn the incense. Now, again, you go, well, that doesn't sound really important to me. That's not a practice that we, we have. But for him... This was a lifetime opportunity. He would have combined the, the spices and the herbs, and he would go in and he would pour them, as the Old Testament says, over the hot coals, and he would produce this smoke, it would produce this smoky perfume. People would have traveled, Scripture says, they had traveled from all these different places to be near the temple outside of this specific section. So it's his turn. He goes in, again, maybe once or twice in his lifetime. He's married to Elizabeth. Having no children, obviously we're going to see they've been praying for a child. He's standing beside the altar. This is taking place. God had not spoken to his people through a prophet, through an angel, through someone in the temple for 400 years. Poor incense, angel. Oh boy. He goes into a holy place. To do what he's called to do. Periodically getting called to the temple. This task that he had performed. Maybe he'd never gotten to perform it yet. But now he has his chance. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. Standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Oh boy. What's about to happen? See you didn't expect this this morning did you? And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. Okay, we didn't really need that, but we're glad the details included because that would have been us. And fear fell upon him, naturally. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. For he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. 
He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He's telling him, this angel is, that your prayer has been heard, but in a way that you could not have imagined, it's going about to be answered. In a time that doesn't even seem possible, it's going to be answered. And who your son is going to be. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Luke chapter 1, you may be familiar with Luke chapter 2. This is speaking about a guy by the name of John the Baptist, not Jesus. But he's going to, Scripture says, he's going to be the one that's going to proclaim that Jesus is right around the corner. So his prayer has been heard. She is going to give birth to this man by the name of John, but also understand something. As a prophet who knew, as a priest who knew all the prophecies of of Isaiah, of Malachi, of the Old Testament, his prayer was also being heard that he hears, listen, my son is going to be the one who's going to tell people that the Messiah is right around the corner. So that means the Messiah is right around the corner. Your prayer is being heard. He's not just going to give you any son. He's going to give you a great son. He's going to be a prophet. So now you're going to have a son. The wait is soon to be over. Can you imagine this guy? It's amazing that he didn't just pass out right there. Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife is advanced in her years. Not a bad question. Clearly, he shows us he's human. He shows us that this dramatic, unexpected moment, he says, I'm too old. My wife is too old. This is not how it's supposed to take place. With an angel standing by, his doubt somehow shifted into disbelief. This just can't happen. How, how is this going to happen? How am I going to know that this is going to happen? Well, there's an angel standing beside you at the altar. He wanted more proof. Now, again, you may have never read their story before. It's one of the most amazing stories. Verse 19 says, And the angel answered him and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Now, I don't know what tone he read that in or said that in, but I imagine it was not the sweetest of tones, right? I am here. I came to tell you this. And behold, verse 20, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. I wonder how many moments of our lives that it would have been better for God just to make us silent so that we could hear him. You're just going to have to be quiet for 40 weeks (laughs) so that you can hear. You're going to need to stop because all of a sudden, you you know this, if you've ever tried to be quiet for an extended period of time, it slows you down immediately. I remember years ago, one of our students here, uh, she decided that she was going to just not speak. I think it was for a week just to listen. How many of us have moments in our lives when God needs to quiet us so that we can hear him? What about at Christmas? And we are so busy. We are so chaotic. We've got so many things to do. Can we even hear? Are we even listening to these stories that we've heard for years? Is it really sinking in? Do we have enough bandwidth to just pause and go, man, I just want to hear. God, what do you desire for me to do today? How would you desire me to serve you today? And one of the busiest seasons, remember, this message to this priest would would not only they would have a child, but that he would be rally. He would be the one that would speak that a Messiah, Jesus Christ, would soon follow. Now, just a couple little notes here to think about. I I think maybe too much about the situation. Um, I'm not sure silence was a really bad thing with a pregnant wife. 
Men in the room, right? You're going, man, what a blessing. I could not stick my foot in my mouth for 40 weeks, right? And the wife is probably going, man, this is fantastic. This guy can't give me any flack, right? Nothing. For unto us is right around the corner. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, verse 21. So he's, he's there inside. Don't, don't lose him. We're going to keep going through this story. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. What's going on in there? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Now, can you imagine the scene? He comes out in all of his royal garb that he would have put on that day, and he's gone in to pray for the people. And what is custom is once he goes in and prays um, in the temple, once he comes out with the incense that he has poured, once he comes out, his job is then to look out on all the people and say, I will pray for you what God has given to me. Problem. He can't talk. Verse 23, and when his time of service ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked, upon, looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. So for five months, she's, she's held up in her house, saying, God has, God has heard our prayer. We, we, we can't even imagine that he's answered it in this way and this time period, but this is God is, is about to deliver. He's about to give us a child. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to tell about the Messiah. But in doing so, here's what this verse 25 conveys to us. She says, to take away my reproach, my shame. My lack of. God answered the personal prayer of his people while keeping his eternal promise. Oh, Elizabeth. You're going to stay tucked away. Now, we're not going to read the story of what she does next. She goes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and this whole amazing thing takes place. But, But here, she stays tucked away. Why? Because in this answer to prayer, it says her reproach has been taken away. God is answering this personal prayer of his people. Everything changed for Zechariah. His prayers were answered. Later, in a way he wanted, not exactly. In the time that he wanted, not exactly. In the manner that he would have imagined, not a chance. But God was answering the personal prayers of his people while he was still keeping his promises. For us. If you rewind into the Old Testament, if you, you go back to Genesis chapter 22, there was a guy by the name of Abraham that God had said, I will make you a father of the nations. Except there was a moment when Abraham was asked to take his only son up onto a mountain to sacrifice him. Yet God steps in and answered his prayer. Why? Because he was moving on a personal way for Abraham while he was pursuing his eternal hope. All the same path in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. There's an incredible story of a guy by the name of Joseph. Some of you have heard his story. Um, He puts Joseph, um, this man who had been thrown into a pit by his brothers, given up for dead. He ends up rising to be the most powerful person in the nation of Egypt, the adversary of God's chosen people. Why? So that God could work on a personal way in Joseph's life while protecting his eternal promises. This is the story of Scripture. He is moving personally, but he is not going away from his eternal promises. In the book of Esther, God provided a Jewish woman to become the queen of a Persian province. Don't have time to dive into that craziness to save God's children. And God said, for such a time as this, it's personal and eternal. God is a personal God. I need you to hear this this morning. He is a personal God to Zechariah, to Elizabeth, with an eternal plan. And it's the same for you. 
He is a personal God with an eternal plan. And we're beginning to see in Luke chapter 1 how this plan is coming to fruition. So we turn this 400 years of silence and God of creation is personal to Zechariah and to Elizabeth, but their son would be John the Baptist, the messenger to prepare the Son of God, people for the Son of God, to begin his ministry. He is a personal God with an eternal plan. He cared about Zechariah and Elizabeth in, in a way. He listened and responded. Now, some of you have been praying prayers for years, and unfortunately, we learn over the years that sometimes God answers those prayers yes, sometimes he answers those prayers no, and sometimes he says, in the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, not quite yet. But I'm still working. I'm still moving. This conveys to me, even in the story of the arrival of John the Baptist that leads us to the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, that God cares about mine and your needs, your longings and your desires. But even when you can't see him moving in the moments, we proclaim hope. May we be What a challenge. Could we be like Zechariah and Elizabeth when we're praying our prayers and they seem to hit the ceiling? What does it say? They were blameless and righteous. It tells us this before they learn about the coming of their son. They kept worshiping. They kept praying. They kept consulting. They kept praying. They kept worshiping. They kept, what does it say? Blameless in the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. God hears our prayers. But our characters, Zechariah and Elizabeth, their child, their story, you you need to know how it all comes together. I want you to to see this. Again, lots of scripture for us this morning. Forty weeks later, actually 40 weeks plus um, eight days, chapter 1, verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. They rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. Now, you wonder, where did the tradition go of getting seniors and juniors? Well, here it is, evidence in Scripture. He's just going to be Zechariah Jr. That's where he's going to get his name. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Every time I read this verse, I have to pause. They made signs to his father. He was mute, not deaf. Anybody? Why don't you just talk to him? Zechariah, why are you doing this? And, and he does what he needs to do. He grabs something, a tablet, all right? So he responds to their going, whatever signs they're making. I'm not even going to try to do that, right? And insult somebody. I mean, they're, they're trying to communicate with him, and he's like, why don't you just talk to me? I can hear you. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. Now listen, stay with me, this unexpected story here that's tucked right here in the middle of the Christmas story that we always jump to. It's right here before all that takes place. And immediately his mouth was open, his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. Now it's turned back around, right? He was in fear, standing by the altar. Now this guy's been silent for an entire pregnancy, and he, the first thing he says, and once he writes his name as John, whew, once he steps into obedience, whew, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, so now you see this? All the people in the region are going, What shall this child be? 
What then shall this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. This is John the Baptist. Don't get confused if you don't know the stories. This is speaking about John the Baptist. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying. Now, before we read this, Zechariah is about to have church, all right? He is about to speak to the people. I mean, he's been holding back, right? I mean, he hasn't been able to speak, and he's been thinking about, when I get a chance to speak to these people, when I get an opportunity to pour forth what I've been learning in all this quiet, when I've been put on the pause button in my quiet time chair, right, over here for the past 40 weeks, I now can tell them how magnificent this moment is that is about, that has just taken place, and about the Messiah that is to come. So he's going to talk about his son, John the Baptist, in this passage, and he's going to outline who the Messiah will be. Listen to him. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This guy's been silent for 40 weeks. He may have cleared his voice a little. Ooh, that felt good, right? For he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. What he does right there, if you've been with us for a few weeks, he reaches all the way back in the Old Testament and he pulls forward the prophecies. He's attaching Jesus as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Stay with me. And you, O child, speaking of his son, John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Now he's going to describe what are the ways of the Messiah. And this is where I want you to see that even in this story of the unexpected arrival of John the Baptist is the message of hope for us in Jesus. Not in John, but in Jesus. He says, here are his ways. He is going to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins Because of the tender mercy of God, listen to this, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. When the Messiah comes, it is going to be as if the sun itself is now with us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way. Of peace. Let's go home. And the child grew, John, grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. But I I don't want to rewind. I want you to hear this. This priest and his aging wife's prayers were not answered in the time or the manner that they could have imagined. Yet God had heard them and God had an eternal plan and Zechariah is going to remind them of the eternal plan that there would be, that their son was going to be the one that was going to start preaching and teaching for unto us. A mighty counselor, wonderful savior, prince of peace, he has come. And who is this Messiah that we need to be reminded of this Christmas season from Zechariah? Salvation will come through him. Forgiveness will come through him. The mercy of God comes through him. The son will bring peace. And what does he say? In verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness. Some of you this morning are sitting in darkness spiritually. You never trusted in Christ. You've never put your hope in this unexpected Savior coming That was prophesied. But you want hope in the middle of darkness? Do you want, what does he say here? Not only in the darkness, in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. 
we live in a world where there seems to be no peace. Where can we find peace? Not in John the Baptist, but in the one that Zechariah tells us about. The one who brings salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins, the mercy of God to those, the one who will give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. He will bring them into peace. This is the Jesus we put our hope in. This is the coming Messiah that is about, we turn the page to chapter 2 and we see this arrival of a king. For unto us displays to all of us that Jesus Christ came in an unexpected way, but this was the plan all along. And he's announcing this child will be significant. His child is making a way for Jesus Christ who will preach salvation. He will be the forgiver, the giver of mercy, the mighty, full of peace. Have you trusted in this unexpected king, Jesus Christ, this Christmas?